Righto, integrated weed management, what's it all about? I've been doing this gig for 11 years now, DAFO the whole time, GRDC funded the whole time, and I think last year I worked it out. So I'm pretty quick, <laughs> took me a long time to work it all out. Uh, and it's, uh, and I think I've got it, and I think, I think I've got it, and I want to hear from, from all of you later on to see if you agree. So I'm Peter Newman, I'm based in Geraldton with the Department of Agriculture and Food, and as I said, I've been there for the past 11 years focused on integrated weed management of resistant weeds. Uh, and so, what is it all about? All of these different tools, I can talk about all of them till the cows come home, but how do they make a grower any more money and make his farming any better? I mean, with less weeds, yeah, it's good, but how does it actually make you more money? I think this is what it's all about, and this is what we just talked about in the last session. It's all about that ability to have such a low seed bank that you can start seeding when you want to. Now, we just heard from Mike Robertson, and there was um, some people in the audience at the end, some loved dry seeding, some didn't. I'm not making an observation as to whether or not you should be dry sowing. What I'm saying is, though, it's all very well to look at that and think, right, next year I'm going dry sowing, but you just, I don't think you can do that if you've got a high seed bank, uh, a high weed seed bank. So I, uh, I opened my big mouth and I said, well, after Mike Robertson, I'll uh, get up and I'll, uh, I'll give a presentation about integrated weed management uh, about how having a low seed bank allows for dry sowing. So I came up with the hypothesis. If we do enough IWM, our seed bank is so low that we don't need a knockdown every year, so perhaps every second year or so. And then I went uh, putting the presentation together and I found almost no data. <laughs> So I'd love to be standing in front of you here saying I've got a heap of good trial data that proves me right. And I was watering the lawn the other day and I thought, bloody hell, what am I going to do? I'm hand watering the lawn as dads do on a hot day after, after work. And uh, what am I going to do? I've got this presentation. I've put my hand up to give it. I've opened my big mouth and I'm not finding any data to back me up. So what I've done is I've, um, I've put together the best, um, some best argument that I can and I'm in danger of doing a Bill Bowden and having an argument with myself and losing. So you can tell me if I do that at the end of the presentation, Bill. But, uh, so I'm going to use some computer simulation and some case study stuff and a little bit of data. And then we can have a good discussion about it at the end. Righto, so let's have a look at some computer simulation. So I started off with RIM. A lot of you have seen RIM. Uh, you can do a 10-year rotation, put in a whole heap of weed management, and it gives you a seed bank and a, uh, and a gross margin. So here is a series of rim runs. Now I've got a truckload of graphs here. I'm going to go through them quite quickly. So just to unpack the first one, this is seed bank on this axis, and this axis is going to change, all right? So on this one, that's 12,000 seeds per square metre in the soil in March, right? It's all a wheat lupin, wheat canola rotation. It's uh, actually 11 years because rim assumes year zero is wheat. It's starting seed bank of 100 seeds per square metre, and in this case, we're talking about just using herbicides, um, we're using trifluralin every second year in the wheat. Canola obviously has atrazine at about 60% control, simazine in the, in the lupins. And I've got select in there, but select working at 90%. So we're in, I'm assuming this situation where we've got herbicides like trifluralin at 75 and select at 90% where some resistance is coming in, okay? And so this paints a pretty uh, dire picture of your weed seed bank over a 10-year rotation if your only solution to weeds for ryegrass is herbicides. And I should point out, I'm, I'm just going to focus on ryegrass here, and I, I'm aware that there's a lot of other weeds. All right, what happens if we start adding some IWM? If we just crop top those lupin crops, take 75% of the weed seed set out, instantly we're, you know, we're, the simulation is telling us lower seed bank and more money. If we then add uh, spray swath in canola, and of course I'm talking about glyphosate, not the other illegal practices. Uh, not that glyphosate is 100% legal, but it's the lesser of the two evils, isn't it? But um, so we're taking out some seed set, uh, spraying under the swath of, uh, of the swather, canola swather with glyphosate. Uh, once again, less weeds, more money. And we add one more, which is pulling a chaff cart every year. So these are all additions. So the black line is a chaff cart every year, as well as the crop topping loop and as well as the spray swath in canola. So if we just zoom in on that, um, that last line, so this is the full IWM package where we're actually eroding a seed bank down to close to zero over a 10 year period. And many of you have seen some of my focus paddocks where we actually have growers uh, doing all of these tools and having this sort of level of success. 
Um, so that's the full IWM package zoomed in. Now what happens if we remove the knockdown? So that's assuming a knockdown every year. All of those graphs so far assuming a knockdown every year. What happens if we remove a knockdown in the uh, lupin and canola? Fairly standard practice. Uh, it's a good result. We're still looking at eroding a seed bank and a, and a low seed bank. And if we remove a knockdown every year, um, once again, another good result. We've got enough IWM going such that we're still eroding a seed bank. So, computer says yes. So that is, uh, it's simulations, computer simulation, right? So it's not real life, but it's the best thing we've got looking forward. So let's have a look at another computer simulation model, the Weed Seed Wizard. Art Diggle is in the audience somewhere. This was developed uh, by Michael Renton and Art Diggle and probably some others who I should acknowledge. Perhaps Art can help us out later on with that. Um, so the Weed Seed Wizard is another seed bank type model, a little bit different to RIM. As far as I understand, Art, it, it tracks a seed through its life cycle um, and then does that for many thousands of seeds. Is that something like how the wizard works compared to RIM? It tracks all the Okay. Yeah, so it's a little bit, got a little bit more biology behind it than, than RIM being a bit more simplistic. So let's have a look. Art ran some, some wizard runs for me, and these are just five years of the same rotation. A little bit hard to see, but this red line is the weed seed bank, and this is the herbicides only situation over five years, okay? So we're using all the same herbicides that we used in our rim runs, but putting it into the wizard. And a reasonably similar story, although this is blowing out much faster, we've got a, a weed seed bank blow out up to 13,000 seeds after five years. The other bit of output that the wizard gives you, and you'll see more of the wizard in the coming years, is um, a, a yield estimate. And so this, this is what it gives you. The, the, bar, the, top, the whole bar is the potential yield and the red bar in the absence of weeds, and the red bar is the actual yield. So that blue there is how much yield the weeds are, are taking out of the yield, okay? So showing that herbicides only blow out in year five, uh, lots of weeds in crop, uh, big yield reduction as a result of the weeds. So uh, once again, we added crop topping lupin. Um, so when we just add that to the lupin crops, uh, we've halved that seed blowout and reduced the yield loss as a result of, of weeds. If we add the spray swath canola with uh, glyphosate, once again, reducing the population. Same story, less yield loss from weeds. And then the full IWM package, chaff cart, adding the chaff cart every year, we're getting to a point where we're eroding a weed seed bank. So, uh, and achieving pretty well the potential weed-free yield. So once again, computer says yes, but once again, it's not real life. It is computer simulation, um, but the wizard, um, we feel that it will have a, uh, a better understanding of more of the biology, taking into account more of the cohorts using real rainfall data uh, and potentially be able to give us good predictions on these things. Okay, so the next bit is some data. And this is actually the bit that uh, caused me to have an argument with myself and lose because it destroyed my argument. <laughs> this is a a long-term uh, ryegrass integrated weed management trial that myself and Cameron Weeks um, did in the Minganu area um, from about 1999 to about 2003 at Tony Blake's property in Irwin. There's a picture of the site there. Uh, we had pasture blocks and canola blocks and different rotations and things going on. And here's the data that destroys my argument a little bit. We had a low ryegrass population created by brown manuring lupins in 1998. It was in pasture, 99, that's the weed seed bank, 70 ryegrass per square metre. Pasture again in 2000, so we were eroding that seed bank. We got it down nice and low, and then we dry sowed the wheat is the blue line, and wet sow the wheat is the red line. So showing that by dry sowing that, that wheat crop, we'd undone all that hard work of getting the seed bank down, we'd basically stepped back a year. Okay, so here's the other bit of data from that same trial in the high ryegrass population. This is where the lupins were harvested in 1998, and so all the seed retained to the soil. Much bigger weed numbers. We're eroding the seed bank. We dry sow the wheat, and once again, we undo it back to where we were back here. So this would suggest that 
Well, it's suggesting a couple of things. One is that if you dry sow wheat, yes, uh, this sown with tri trifluralin. If you dry sow wheat, yes, you are putting more pressure on the on the system and you are having potential to increase the weed numbers. The other thing it's showing though is if you have a relatively high seed bank like this one, you're going back to 450 or 500 seeds a square metre. Whereas the previous one, the lower seed bank, we're actually only blowing out to 40 ryegrass seeds per square metre. So perhaps there is an argument there in favour of, of what I'm suggesting is if the seed bank is low enough, dry sowing a wheat crop and only blowing out to 40 seeds, it's not a train wreck, is it? It's, it's still at a, a low manageable level. So trial data says no. <laughs> okay, Bill Roy, Bill showed this data um, at the crop updates uh, several years ago, and I'm not really sure if it really adds to my <laughs> argument or not, but what he found was that more years in pasture equals more years in crop. So this line here, is, this is the ryegrass seed bank again. This is where the, the paddock was just dropped out for one year and then went into five years of wheat, right? And obviously the ryegrass blowing out. This one, the dotted line was where he dropped it out for two years, but the, that line there is where he dropped it out for three years, got the seed bank down very, very low, and then went to five years of wheat and it is still very low. So I think that really just adds, adds a bit of weight to the argument that if your seed bank is low enough, you can keep it on that zero line despite problems with herbicide resistance. And once again, that's what we're seeing from some of our focus paddocks. So as I said, Bill Roy says more time in pasture equals more time in crop. Really just, if you can get a seed bank very, very low, you can keep it very, very low. At the uh, Probably the best bit of evidence that I have in um, suggesting that integrated weed management gives you licence for that early sowing is a case study with this fella here, Lance Turner. And Lance is in the audience. He, I promised him that I wouldn't use that photo, but it was such a bad photo, Lance, I couldn't resist it. So, <laughs> so that, I think the deal's off now. Lance said, if I take the photo out, I can use his case study. Anyway, so um, Lance has been continuous cropping since 1990. Resistant ryegrass was discovered in 1992 on his farm. So he's been battling it for most of the time that he's been continuous cropping. This is how this is how he approaches seeding. It is that seed by the calendar approach uh, that he farms over three blocks, so he can't be waiting for a, the right break in all of them. He really wants to get seeding and get finished uh, by sometime in late May. So really he has a seed by the calendar approach. He uses a trifluralin spray line across the front of his seeding bar. Um, really that just means that the boom spray is no longer married to the seeder. And also you get that instant incorporation of, um, of uh, trifluralin. Uh, but this is the, the key to the whole system is this chaff cart. And myself and Lance and Ray Harrington and Mike Walsh and Steve Powers, we went on a road show last year talking about harvest weed seed management. And we didn't really speak to each other much before we went, but we all rocked up with the same message. And that was that this is all about doing this stuff at harvest is all about allowing you to sow early. And Lance turned up and really convinced us of that, I think. Now the trick is that this is a uh, chaff cart with a conveyor belt type system rather than the air slinger type system, um, which uh, I think has some really big benefits and chaff carts are back in favour. Um, they sold a lot of them a couple of years ago, not so many last year because of the, the dry conditions. But uh, we surveyed 127 growers, 10 of them were towing chaff carts, but 28 of them indicated that they were thinking about buying one. So chaff carts, I think, are coming back. And I actually have a renewed enthusiasm after speaking to Lance at the updates a couple of years ago, and partially because of this conveyor belt system. The conveyor belt system, you can see there some straw ends up going into the heaps, and that's the key to the whole thing. That straw going into the heaps means that you've got a fast um, burn time of the heaps because there's a bit more air in them. So they'll burn out in eight to 10 hours. And also you can potentially run a baler through them and bale that residue if you have a year like this one and you need a bit of extra revenue. The other good part about them is there's less infrastructure on the back of the header. It's all on the chaff cart. So, so while it is a big job to convert one of these things and get it going, um, it is relatively, if you change headers, uh, there's less work to do uh, uh, in managing, you know, the, old, the other system involves putting cross augers and things on the header. They're not there with the, with the conveyor belt type system. Right, the other tools that Lance is using is to crop top all of his lupins, grows competitive crops. 
It's a loop and wheat, wheat, loop and barley, barley rotation. He uses some Midas. He's only had one shot of select over his whole farm, so he's managed to keep his ryegrass numbers at bay using other herbicides, and he's in a very strong position there where select is still an excellent tool for him. And the old chemistry is still working for radish. So it's all anecdotal, but we find that the people that are doing all of this integrated weed management, and particularly the harvest um, stuff, is that they they have less of a radish problem and in a lot of cases are managing with the older chemistry rather than having to jump straight on the bandwagon and the new ones. So really, we don't, once again, I don't have data with Lance's ryegrass numbers, but if we ask him, and he might comment at the end of it, the farm is getting cleaner. Uh, he's been continuous cropping for 22 years. It's not a completely clean farm, but it is getting cleaner and it's improving and he is sowing by the calendar. So. In addition to that, we have, I have some other case studies with my focus paddocks that I'll, um, that I'll present to you over the coming years, I think, because I think this is going to be a big topic for us. And that's the other thing. There has been no knockdown at seeding for Lance in 2006, 2009 and 2010. And yes, once again, as I say, there are still weeds on the farm, but that, that early sowing really has benefited. Last year, he had, we stood in the barley crop that was going 2.9 tonnes it went 2.9 tonnes per hectare that was sown on the 28th of May. Oh, sorry, the wheat was sown on the 28th of May. It went 1.6, but it was really quite a remarkable crop for that very little bit of growing season rainfall, 134 mils. And over the whole farm, just that early sowing um, really did benefit all the crops. Even though it's a low yield, it was a bit of a train wreck of a year. Right, so Lance says yes. So... Uh, that's Ray Harrington and Steve Powers. Ray uh, in front of the um, third prototype of the Harrington seed destructor. And what does Ray say? Well, after visiting that barley crop of lances, he stood in there and said, right, this is where I want to be in five years' time. I can see that I'm towing my destructor. I've got the backup plan at the end of har at harvest. I can see that I want to be sowing by the calendar. It's going to take me a few more years, he believes, another four or five years to get his seed banks to the point where he can do that. So it's not that thing where we can decide, OK, we want to go dry sowing every year. Right, let's start next year. It's not that. It's really, let's get the integrated weed management going with all of these tools added up for three or four years, and then we'll be able to sow by the calendar. So what do I say? Well, this is what I've coined as a result of all of this. I believe that if you don't get a knockdown at the beginning of the season, make sure you get one at the end. And we have some different tools where we can get that. We've got crop topping lupins. We've even got crop topping wheat with glyphosate if you want to go down that path. It's a whole other issue. It is registered on the PowerMax label. Uh, and chaff carts and, and all those other sort of knockdowns at the end of the, end of the season. So I just think that's a good motto to have. But really, overall, what I'm saying is that, is that integrated weed management has been something I've been trying to sell a different way every year for 11 years, right? And this is the way I really think it will sell in that it gives that licence to, to be able to sow early, and that is truly the way that growers can realise the, the extra income. So it's less about resistant weeds, and it's more about just having such a low seed bank that the weeds aren't dictating to the grower when they can sow. And it's as simple as that. So that's the argument I've put forward. Like I say, I don't have as much data as I'd like to have on the issue, but it is something I'll certainly I think we'll pursue in the coming years to add more data to the argument. And I'd really like to hear some of your comments. There's a lot of experience in the room. That there may be other growers that you've, uh, you're observing having similar success. Thank you very much. Um, those uh, paddocks that you had early on where you showed your decline in weeds and then they kicked up, uh, it's more a question of how you measured the seed bank decline. Was that about measuring seed heads and seeds in those crops or was it about measuring the seeds that were in the soil? Because if it was measuring seeds in the crop, you've taken them down, but when you dry seeded, that kickback might be due to some old seeds, whereas if you could manage to keep that seed bank down for five years, your old bank may not then cause that kick up. So it's a question about how you did it and then depending on the answer, you might stop arguing with yourself. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. I think. The reason it kicked up is it was the old seed bank germinating because in the dry sown wheat crop there was actually very low ryegrass numbers and as there was in the wet sown. So you're dead right, 
and it's a good point which I should have made myself in that, as Bill Roy showed, that if it was out for three or four years beforehand, that seed bank may have been so low that it wouldn't kick back up. So the way we did it was the, um, the ryegrass in the dry sown crop was counted at knockdown and in the crop, and then the, where it kicked back up, that was ryegrass in pasture the next year, so it really does represent the full seed bank. And I think you're right, I think it was the old seed bank germinating rather than a, from a blowout in the dry sown wheat crop. Oh, I, I, a quick question for you, Pete. What would you have, a dry sown wheat crop or in terms of weeds or a wet sown wheat crop with no knockdown? So dry sown today or wet sown tomorrow? Because, I mean, we talk about weeds as being one of the major reasons why people don't dry sow, aside from risk and, to a lesser degree, erosion these days. Um, but in my experience, the person that's worried about weeds, as soon as it rains, he's flat out sowing that same paddock that he wouldn't dry sow because of weeds the day before. Yeah. So that's exactly the point. The knockdown, really, regardless of what we sow, whether or not you can get away with it, is a shot duck, just about. People are dry sowing 20 to 50% of their program. It rains and they start sowing the rest. And for the last about three days, they're getting a knockdown on weeds this big, aren't they? So they're really not getting a knockdown. We're really just seeing that the guys that have used a lot of IWM, particularly windrow burning and crop topping lupins, the main two tools, have their seed bank so low that they're just so confident that they can have their whole seeding program in uh, and low weeds without a, without a knockdown. So I'm, I think I'd rather have the, the dry sown crop and then have the backup plan. As I say, like, I've, okay, I've dry sown it, let's do something at the end of the year. I mean, the quote was Andrew Messina, you know, he said, I crop topped some lupins last year. They didn't really need crop topping, but I just felt like I was putting my knockdown on six months in advance. So people say, oh, crop topping is expensive and so on, but by crop topping that lupin crop, he, he killed his weeds then instead of, you know, waiting for a knockdown the, the following year. I'm practising windrow burning myself, but only been doing it for a few years. Um, the only thing that we can see with it that we're concerned about is the long-term nutrient loss uh, in, in the, the residue that we're burning, particularly in canola. A couple of questions. Do you find guys that are either uh, desiccating canola is enough or the desiccation and the windrowing in combination? Or can we get away with dropping the windrow and windrowing out of the canola and just the swath spraying or desiccation as one part? And have you got any data on guys that have been doing it for the 10 or 11 years, how their nutrient status within paddocks has ticked along, especially to relate it back to some of the topics earlier in the day with our phosphate inputs and potash is probably more one of the other ones, but, and we're trying to reduce those as part of our whole farming risk and program. Yep, so uh, the first one, um, if you spray swath canola, do you need to then windrow burn? Now, I haven't got exhaustive measures on the ryegrass control with spray swathing of canola, and it's extremely variable, and I think there's a huge difference between more the southwest corner and the northern region in the efficacy there. So I don't have um, good um, data on that, I'm sorry. I would suggest, though, that windrow burning of canola, it really is extremely successful, uh, given that it is generally relatively easy to concentrate the windrow and burn just the windrow and contain the fire to the windrow, and it's the hottest one. So I just think that anyone that, that any of the farmers that sort of preach to you about integrated weed management, they just say never miss an opportunity. So I would say, the, with, with that issue, I would say, even if I've spray swath canola, I would just assume that I haven't done a great job and that I should windrow burn as well. So that's the first one. In terms of the nutrient banding, the high nutrient strips in the paddock. Yeah, there has been a lot less nutrient banding and stripy paddocks than I ever would have thought. And I thought we were going to create a big problem there. It does happen, but there's a lot less of it than I thought. Things like lupins and canola, they do drop a lot of leaves and stuff on the surface before you then put it in the windrow. So a lot of that nutrition is actually retained on the paddock, whereas something like wheat, it obviously all goes in there. Potash is the main nutrient going in there, and obviously it's a liming effect. Um, so a lot of the growers are quoting that they are really just keeping a very close eye on their potash levels. 
Uh, and if you listen to Bill, Bill says it's the best diagnostic tool you've got in that if you see the high strip, then you can say, why is that high yielding? And do the paired tissue test and work out, is it potash or is it the lime effect? Perhaps do the soil test as well and, um, and use it as a diagnostic tool. The big point I want to make, and I did joke that I was going to do this by interpretive dance, <laughs> I'm not going to spare you of that, but is to move your windrows every year because there's a lot of people with auto steer headers now and that's really happened in the last couple of years and I really think that we need to shift them over every year a couple of feet because if we auto steer our headers and we put them in the same spot every year there is no doubt we're going to create very high um, potash and high lime strips. So I think we have the ability to auto steer those headers in slightly different spot every year and I think that'll be an important thing in the coming, coming up.